What up guys, Joaquin here, and this video is going to talk about the garments of the priest, both the priestly garments of Israel that served in the temple in Jerusalem, as well as the Levitical priest that is, as well as the Orthodox priest who continue in that tradition today. And some of you might be confused by that statement, but I will get into everything. So um, I have searched here for priestly garments, that's it. I didn't specify anything, but you can see um, if I click on some of these, uh, this is specifically a high priest. So only in um, the, would the, the high priest serve in, in these garments. It would have only been one person, not the whole priesthood. You can see up here it says Kadosh La Adonai, or to yod -Heh vav -Heh, La yod -Heh vav -Heh, uh, Holiness or Holy holy God. Um, they quote, they translate that as holiness unto um you know yhvh um i okay i mean i guess i guess maybe or i would say holy unto yeah i mean holiness unto yeah that, that makes sense okay sorry um so you see he has like an incensor down here these are the exact um models for the incensors that you'll continue to see in the orthodox church today um, so basically, the priest, the the normal vestments of a um, priest serving in the temple. Uh, so over here, you see that there's these uh, this other guy. So this would have been more like the Levitical priests, and you know, in spite of what people sometimes want to claim, um, it's not entirely accurate to say that these came from paganism. So I, I see a lot of people usually from like some kind of messianic or like uh cultish uh propagandist kind of things where, where their whole basis is about how everybody else is is wrong and they'll point to like the ancient churches and talk about how they were invaded by paganism um but the the priestly garments like all the priests and all the religions and pretty much all the people of the ancient world had robes that <laughs> that they wore and, and it, it was very common, um, not just from the clergy, but just for everyday wear. It was, you know, four corner garments. Um, you, you know, that was the style of how people dressed. The only reason that many of the priests today in the Orthodox church and, um, you know, in, in other churches mimicking the, the, the priesthood, that the only reason that they continue that is because it's commanded in the scripture. So you can see other groups here, like this would have been, um, you can see the uh, high priest there on the far left, and then beside him would have been the Levitical priesthood. So these are all the priests um, serving in the temple. And so that's just a little bit about that. I don't know what I just did there. Um, yeah. So as the apostles... Uh, continued on as, as Jesus anointed the apostles and, and set them aside for the work of the ministry, in a way they, they were consecrated to continue on this work of being priests unto God. And they established bishops and, and other episcopos and presbyters, or in, in English we'll say bishops and priests, and they established those to continue on this priestly work or continue on to do this function. And uh, so in scripture, a, a good question that somebody brought up a little while back on my channel was, isn't it only the, uh, you know, the, of the tribe of Levi that are supposed to serve though as, as priests? And why, why then do you have these people who are not Levites? Well, Let's turn to a very important passage of scripture. This is the prophet Isaiah, and I am in chapter 66. And if we go down to verse 21, uh, sometimes this app, this is, uh, it works great if I hold it upright <laughs> and then it disappears. Uh, so I can get it to work. Okay, I'm gonna be very ginger about this. This is the Orthodox Study Bible. I promise that the app works just fine usually, but when I turn on the camera, it can be a little funky, and especially when I turn it um, sideways, sometimes with the camera on, it behaves differently. I don't. It doesn't like. Uh, it's very private. It, it it doesn't like coming out to play. I'm just kidding. All right, but so we get on here to uh, towards the end. I think I'm in. 
yeah, here's verse 21. I'm going to start at 20 just to get into it. Um, this is the end of the prophet Isaiah, and he says, They shall bring your brethren from among all the Gentiles as a gift to the Lord, and with horses and chariots and litters drawn by mules and covered with sunshades, to the holy city of Jerusalem, says the Lord, just as the children of Israel would bring me their sacrifices with psalms into the house of the Lord. And get this, verse 21, And I shall take some of them. Who is them? The Gentiles. They shall bring your brethren from among the Gentiles. So, and then right before that, they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. And I shall take some of them to be priests and Levites, says the Lord. So God is taking these, he says he's going to take these Gentiles, some from among these Gentiles, and make them priests. This whole chapter is about um, coming from the Gentiles to worship at the holy mountain. So, you know, th these are people who are being called out from the nations to be Israel, to be the priest, to be all of these things. And he will choose some of them. He will, he, he will take some of them to be his priest, says the Lord. So who are we to question, to, to backtrack on that and say otherwise? And we're nobody. We're fools if we say otherwise. So now the priest of the New Testament, the New Testament priesthood, the Orthodox Christian priesthood, is somewhat different, though, than the, their vestments, the clothes they wear. It's not paganism. In fact, it's, it's drawn very much from the Scripture, uh, from the New Testament Scriptures. Um, so I have pulled open. You can see there's all these different colors, and the different colors, um, sometimes they pertain to different seasons of the church or different... Um, different time periods. So the, the all black uh, priesthood, it says, you see, it says men's Russian style cassock. Um, the, these have different symbolic meanings. And that would not be worn typically while serving as a priest. That would be worn while serving outside of the priesthood. And then these others, they, they you know, if it's at a, at a uh, feast or at different things, and I'll get more into detail about that. They have different meanings if it is uh, at, um, there, there's an interesting picture, if it's um, during certain liturgical seasons of the church. So the apostles, as they began to reinterpret scripture and pass traditions down in the church, they reinterpreted how the feasts of Israel were to be carried out. And rather than um, keeping the old tradition, the old um, veiled tradition of the Feast of Israel, the apostles, and then the church continued to develop and continued to, um, you know, work through the liturgical year and how, how the calendar would be carried out in the Orthodox Church or through the Christian Church. It wasn't just the Orthodox Church, it was just one church. And... Um, yeah, there was just one Christian church, that is. So there were other groups like the Donatists and the Gnostics and things like that. But they continued to work out this, and the feast then began to take on new things. So, um, you know, they, they decided on certain dates. So sometimes people will look at Christmas or a nativity. We, you know, from the East, they, they actually don't have a word for Christmas like that. Um, they've adopted the word Christmas because of Western influence. But the, the feast is called the, the Feast of the Nativity. And in the Catholic Church, because it was Latin, they would call it the Latin, in Latin, the, the Mass, the Christ Mass. So it was the birth of Christ. So that's where we get this term Christmas from. But um, the reason that they chose that was be not because they were integrating worship of the sun god, but rather it was because they were doing it in response to the... Um, the Romans who worshipped the sun god on that day, they it was a it was a protest. They were they were kind of like Protestants in that way. They were Protestants from the Romans. They refused to bow down and they refused to have anything to do with the worship of the Roman sun god. So they worshipped the true sun, the true birth of the true Christ, the true God on that day instead. And uh, it actually wasn't December 25th. I think it was January 8th or what we call that now. They didn't have these Western names like December and January. Uh, so they didn't, English in the form that we know it didn't even exist in that time period. So 
uh, you know, that's, that's one of those. The most important day was, of course, Pascha. And these all fit into the, um, the, the liturgical year. So uh, the, the choice for um, nativity to be in December did actually have to do with the time period of the birth of Christ um, estimated based on the Day of Atonement when Elizabeth is in, you know, she becomes pregnant, presumably with, um, well, not presumably, she becomes pregnant with um, her husband, um, Zacharias, in the, the gospel. So when you read that in the gospel, I think it's in the gospel of uh, Luke, uh, Matthew. Matthew and Luke both have these nativity stories. So it might be in both. It's it's at least in one. But um, he goes in, he serves as the, as the priest. He goes in to offer the sacrifice for that year. And while he's in there, the angel appears to him. So based on the time period of that in this kind of elaborate way of like determining nine months out based on the normal gestation time of for pregnancy, um, they, they kind of estimate the time period from that on when Jesus will be born. Um, so because I think when Mary goes to see Martha, um, there's a certain time period so they can guesstimate about the time periods. So they don't know exactly when it is, but it's approximately at that time. But that has nothing to do with why that date's chosen. That date's chosen because of the new year beginning in September, um, or what we call September anyway. So the, the liturgical year or the, the, the beginning of the year for Orthodox Christianity is in September. And then so our, our feasts begin then. There's the, the nativity of the Theotokos, Mary. She's born. And then there's a, I think there's another feast to Mary. And then there's the feast to Christ, the, the birth of Christ in December then. So that sets off this pattern. And with the, the Pascha then coming, Pascha is the Greek word for Passover, it's and that's what's written in the New Testament when you, you read in the, the, the original writing, the Greek uh, New Testament, it'll say Pascha, and that's where that comes from, for the, the Pascha, Passover of the Jews. Anyway, so that's way off topic. But uh, so you can see these different colors, different forms. This is the undergarment of the Orthodox Church, you can see there. Um, and that's the OCA Orthodox Church in America website. Uh, so this goes into some details on vestments, and this is really good. So uh, they talk about the undergarment. This is actually, technically, this is the un, the garment that all Christians wear. So in the, the feast of the marriage supper of the Lamb, you, you kind of read this story in the Gospels where Jesus tells where um, the... It, you know, they go out and they invite people from the highways and the byways, and they find one man who, is, who does not have the wedding garments on. And they say, how did you get in here? And so that man then is, has to leave, and he goes into outer darkness. But this is the baptismal garment of the Orthodox Church. So all Christians, whether you can see it or not, they wear these garments, and it is just the baptismal garments of, of Christianity, having been born again through baptism, you know, dead, you know, Christ, as Christ um, was crucified and rose again, we go down into the waters and then come up to newness of life. So this second garment here, the second fundamental vestment for the clergy is the stole or epitrachelion, which goes around the neck and shoulders. It is a sign of the pastoral office. Um, so some of these are detailed also in the in the uh, the book of Exodus in chapter twenty eight. Uh, it's not exactly the same though. Like I said, you know they they reinterpreted those uh, garments. But you can read in the book of Exodus in chapter twenty eight, and it'll give you quite. Is it twenty eight? Let me go back to the Bible for a second. I want to make sure I'm not telling you guys the wrong books, and then you go there, and you're like, this guy didn't even know what he was talking about. He was telling us to go here. Uh, yeah, so chapter 28 in Exodus is where it goes through the priest vestments, and it largely focuses on the high priest, but you'll see things like the linen ephod and uh, things that you know might be applicable in both places. So I, I don't remember the names of all these things. They give them here. Um, like I, I, I'm not a priest, so I, I don't actually wear these things. These I just, you know, wear kind of semi-dress clothes, <laughs> business casual kind of clothes. Um, there's a belt that's worn. Um, yeah, so and then uh, here is the, uh, the incensor. Of course, that's commanded in, in, in the book of Exodus as well. 
think there is, I pulled open a site. Oh, I wanted to go to this. This is, um, you know, modern day in Judaism. These are uh, Jewish uh, Jews, Jewish clergy from Greece. And you can see that their, their clothes, they end up wearing clothes very much like the Orthodox um, priests and deacons will wear outside of uh, their role serving as priests. So that's just kind of something to, to look at. So they're called the Romaniot Jews, and they've been in um, Greece since ancient times, uh, staying there. They've been kind of permanent citizens. Um, the uh, deacons' vestments are very similar to the priests'. Um, you can see they wrap themselves when preparing and serving and helping the priest to pre prepare the bloodless sacrifice that is the body and blood of Christ um, that, uh, you know, they, they help serve uh, as part of that. So in, in the liturgy, they actually call it in the divine liturgy, the the um, the bloodless sacrifice. This is funny. This actually looks like a priest I know named Father Silvio. <laughs> it's funny to see that there. That's like an old painting, but I, I swear it looks it looks a lot like him, actually. Uh, that's funny. I just happened to look over and see that. Anyway, so I get out of that. Um, and then, so this was a site I found that went over, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, I don't know what that says. SpokaneFavs.com. And um, yeah, it was asking Eastern Orthodox Christian significance of vestments. So uh, they go down a line. I don't have the pictures to go along. Oh, no, I'm sorry. They do. That's excellent. Okay, so there is this meaning, this New Testament meaning that's given to all these things. And uh, one that I know that I'm not sure is in here is the undergarment. So when you read in the Gospels, there is this undergarment that Christ wears. And it says that they cast lots for it. And it was a seamless garment. Well, so the Orthodox priest will wear a seamless garment after the manner of Christ. So that's kind of what I'm saying. Like all of the symbolic New Testament um, things are integrated into these vestments. And so I, I say all this basically to try to prove and show that these things, these, these crazy people come up with about paganism and the Orthodox Church being pagan and integrating paganism is, is horrible lies. And it, it's horrible lies from people that I think are legitimately just deceived and um, have believed lies. They believe false teachers. They believed false Christs that um, claim to uh, be speaking from God, and, and they're not. They're just, they're liars. Anyway, so um, you can read more about each of these things. They each have symbolic meaning, but I'll, I'll kind of cut the video off there and and leave it. They, they do go into some detail about the colors and how they're applicable, and I'll, I'll go over a little bit of that since I said that I would. Um, so the gold color um, can be wear, worn, the, the group of feasts and days commemorating our Lord Jesus Christ, the prophets, the apostles, and the holy hierarchs. So if it's a feast day or a certain day dedicated to those topics, then they'll wear the gold um, out, garment that you sometimes see. Uh, the vestment color, if it's light blue or white, these are days of feast commemorating the most holy mother of God, the, the Virgin Mary, the Theotokos, the God-bearer, um, or bodiless powers and, uh, and, and virgins. So there's the, the parable of the, um, the virgins that, um, you know, you read in the New Testament how they they kept their oil lamps trimmed. Uh, that would be an example of a feast like that where we um, do that. The purple or red, these are days and groups of feasts commemorating the cross of the Lord. Um, if uh, days color where it's own, oh, that was dark red. So this is of red daily uh, feasts uh, commemorating martyrs. Uh, dark red vestments are worn on great and holy Thursday with black and holy altar. So anyway, you can see like there's uh, colors that are designated for specific feasts and time periods of the church. And yeah, so that's it. Hopefully that helped um, at least point you in the right direction if you're looking for more things about uh, the vestments or you've believed some of these lies from people about how it, you know, was pulled from paganism or something like that. It wasn't, but you guys take it easy and I'll talk to you soon.